to Varanasi owes itself because of this invitation by the temple of learning, the Banaras Hindu University. BHU has been aptly given this moniker not only for the similarity of its architecture to the temples of Varanasi, but because all students passing through its halls firmly believe in the power of education and in participating in an intellectual tradition. This belief is firmly rooted in BHO's motto, which roughly translates into English as knowledge imparts immortality. With its rich history, it is a daunting task for me to speak about the history of the faculty of law and of BSU. It is apparent from the very fact that we are gathered here today to celebrate 100 years of the faculty of law. BHU itself celebrated its centenary in 2015. The question I asked myself then is how does one begin to capture the essence of an institution so deeply rooted not only in the history of this city but of India and its legal tradition to truly appreciate and capture the magnitude of this occasion. Let me begin by speaking a little bit about the history of the institution itself. In order to contextualize the location of BHU and its faculty of law within the history of Indian education, it is important to speak about the status quo that preceded them. The first universities of India were founded by the Britishers in 1857. These were the universities of Bombay, Calcutta and Madras, located in the three presidency towns of the British Raj. Their goal was to impart education in a western secular model so as to create a set of Indian civil servants who would be loyal to the British Raj. Soon, Punjab University followed in 1882 and the United Provinces, that is our modern day Uttar Pradesh, got the Allahabad University in 1887. Curiously, one of the factors for the creation of the Allahabad University was because the High Court was moved to Allahabad from Agra and its proceedings were conducted entirely in English. As such, the Allahabad University was often considered as a bastion of Anglicization since it prioritized education in English and even refused affiliation to any college in those days which did not have a European principle. There is a beautiful book by Leah Renner in 2005 published by the Oxford University Press A Hindu Education Early Years of the Banaras Hindu University which I would recommend to all our students. It was in this backdrop that the movement for the creation of BHU found its stride. BHU was preceded by the Central Hindu College, which was founded by Annie Besson and Bhagwan Das in Varanasi in 1898. The college offered a combination of Western education along with education in the Hindu traditions. It was then the efforts of BHU's founder, Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya, which led to the creation of BHU in 1915. Pandit Malviya's vision for BHU was clear and even today is the first text that one reads when they visit BHU's website. I quote his vision which states as follows. India, he said, is not a country of the Hindus only. It is a country of the Muslims, the Christians and the Parsis too. The country can gain strength and develop itself only when the people of different communities in India live in mutual goodwill and harmony. It is my earnest hope and prayer, he said, that this center of life and light which is coming into existence will produce students who will not only be intellectually equal to the best of their fellow students in other parts of the world, but will also live in noble life and love their country.
मदन मोहन मालवीय विजन वॉज अ विजन ऑफ इंक्लूजन ए विजन ऑफ कंपैशन ए विजन ऑफ म्यूचुअल को एग्जिस्टेंस ए विजन ऑफ द नोबिलिटी ऑफ द ह्यूमन सोल एंड माइंड टू लिव विद ईच अदर एंड एक्सेप्ट ईच अदर एज वी आर पंडित मालवीय एमबीसीज बी एच यू as a space which would be tolerant of not only all religions and castes but also as a space which would accommodate all intellectual traditions indeed bhu also made significant contributions to ed- the education and liberation of women during its founding era the large number of women in today's audience must be mindful of the power of the vision of, of those who founded this institution to be where we are today ironically the british support for bhu came from a belief that it would produce students well versed not only in western education but in the hindu tradition which would promote loyalty and subservience to their british rulers however quite to the contrary bhu became a bastion of pride for those who believed that indians could stand on their own two feet and no longer needed the assistance of the british as the first residential university of india which not only exercised control over its college examinations but also their teaching bhu provided its students with a perfect atmosphere to help their intellectual growth and to create leaders of the future indeed scholars have noted that the founding of bhu led to the development of a strong sense of nationalism in the decade which followed over the years bhu has produced many notable alumni in the field of law one has to first speak about the legal acumen of pandit malviya himself in one of the most memorable moments of his career legal career pandit malviya argued for four days and ensured that 151 individuals were freed who had been accused for participating in the burning down of a police station in the chori chora during the non cooperation movement such was the temperament of the man himself who could not sit idly when he saw injustice being committed the current chancellor of bhu was also a student of bhu and retired as a judge of the ilahabad high court professor ramraj pant finished his llp from bhu and subsequently was instrumental in the founding of nepal's first law school through his example we can understand how bhu not only influence legal tradition in india but its neighboring countries as well even in fields other than law bhu has produced notable alumni chintamani nagesh ramchandra rao a bharat ratna winning indian chemist who has previously served as the head of the scientific advisory council to the prime minister did his masters from bhu the pioneer of india's first satellite launch aryabhata in 1975 udupi ramchandra rao who later served as chairman of isro also did his masters from bhu even in the field of arts bhu has alumnus such as the bharat ratna winning singer musician poet and filmmaker bipin bupen hazarika if i am being completely honest i could take up all the time of this function to speak about the history of bhu the faculty of law and its notable alumni and yet not cover any significant ground such is the grand history of the institution we all stand in today and pay homage to but one cannot live in the past forever however comforting the thought may be Hence, I must now move on to my thoughts on some issues of the present time, before we can finally begin imagining a future for the institution. Keeping this in mind, 
I shall now speak to you about a pressing concern for legal education today, which is the role of clinical legal education. I have chosen this topic for today's event since the law faculty at DHU was one of the first six universities in India to start clinical legal services. Hence, there is no better occasion to discuss its future than at the centennial celebration of the law faculty. Undoubtedly, India has a rich tradition of providing legal aid to the underprivileged and marginalized members of society. Article 39A of the Constitution states that the state shall secure that the operation of the legal system promotes justice on a basis of equal opportunity and shall in particular provide free legal aid by suitable legislation or scheme or in any other way to ensure that opportunities for securing justice are not denied to any citizen by reason of economic or other disability. In furtherance of this aim, the Legal Services Authority Act was enacted by Parliament in 1987 and subsequently the National Legal Services Authority was created. Every state has its own legal services authority. Legal aid clinics and committees are attached to the Supreme Court, to the High Court and even many district courts. Indeed, many law schools in India today also have their own legal aid clinics, including BHU. However, this feat was not achieved in one day. It was in 1973 when the Expert Committee on Legal Aid first recommended that law schools to their professors and students should be directly involved in legal aid programs. Their report noted that properly channelized and coordinated, the idealism and zeal of enthusiastic youth in our law schools can meet these new demands upon the legal profession and help transform our society to desirable goals. Subsequently, in 1977, the Juridic Committee on Legal Aid rejected the notion that legal aid should only mean providing peaceful meal aid for individual litigants, but held that it should be broad enough to encompass any action taken to help the most destitute and marginalized individuals to realize their legal and constitutional rights. To achieve this, the committee strongly believed in relying on law schools and stated that law teachers, legal researchers, and law students, once harnessed to the process of legal aid, will produce spectacular and substantial results. The report of the Committee for Implementing Legal Aid Schemes in 1981 similarly recommended the setting up of legal aid clinics in all law schools. In 2009, the Bar Council of India passed a resolution declaring that all law schools should establish their own legal aid cells or clinics. However, in spite of this tradition, scholars have still noted that the response of Indian law schools to legal aid has not been as enthusiastic as one would have hoped. In fact, in 2011, a study was conducted by the government of India along with the United Nations Development Programme to assess the impact of the Bar Council of India's resolution in 1997, which made legal aid clinics a compulsory paper in all law schools. The study found that while 82% of our law schools had designated faculty to conduct legal aid activity, only a minuscule number actually provided them any academic credit. While legal aid clinics existed, Law schools rarely made the effort to inform the community about them, and these clinics rarely offered sustained community engagement. To put it simply, the situation was dismal, and the experiment seemed to have failed. Which begs the question, why were law schools unable to provide sustained legal aid to their communities? I believe that the answer lies in the separation of the law school's legal aid clinics from actual clinical legal education. Clinical legal education evolved as a concept in the United States during the 20th century. Within the ambit of clinical legal education, students participate in running legal aid clinics not merely as volunteers 
but as part of their coursework, where they are actually supervised by their professors and trained lawyers. At its core, clinical legal education has two tenets. The first principle is that formal legal education is not enough to train law students to be good lawyers. And they require practical education as well. Such an education can be provided by their participation in legal aid clinics, which will help them to apply their doctrinal understanding to practice while developing key practical skills and gaining a real life experience in legal ethics. The second principle is that running such clinics would also ensure that legal aid becomes available free of cost to the underprivileged and marginalized individuals in society. But free legal aid to the poor and the marginalized cannot be and should not be equated with poor legal aid, which is where the movement is threatening to degenerate in India. While the current state of legal aid clinics does not sound far from clinical legal education, the reality is very different. The primary difference is that clinical legal education put legal aid at the center of a law student's education rather than as one of the fringe activities, one of the peripheral activities being conducted on the law school campus. Including legal aid as part of law school curricula allows law professors to dedicate time to these services as part of their teaching requirements. Classroom teaching can then also be effectively combined with the practical skills students gain while working at their clinic. The Government of India and UNDP's report of 2011 also recommended that law schools should establish their legal aid clinics not only on their campus but also off campus where the local residents will find it easier to visit such as including the jails and the central jails. These clinics should have fixed hours and working days which should be widely publicized in the community. Law schools should aim to also collaborate with legal aid societies, NGOs, and government authorities in order to provide their services to the widest possible audience. The report also offers a note of caution. The limitations of these clinics must be understood by the faculty and by the students themselves so that do they do not promise services which they are ultimately unable to deliver. I believe these are the very practical realities that students can learn by partaking in clinical legal education. Only by doing so can budding law students understand the professional responsibility that accompanies the duty of ensuring an individual's life and liberty is not unfairly taken away by the law. It will also teach law students the importance of professional commitment, that is, the importance of representing one's clients to the best of their ability in order to ensure that justice is done. Doing so requires a lawyer to never give up on a case and always work to find arguments to further the case of their clients. In very simple terms, providing legal aid to individuals is the need of the hour right now. According to the National Judicial Data Grid, the Allahabad High Court has 4,65,496 pending criminal cases, out of which the largest majority of cases have been pending for the last 10 to 20 years. Similarly, the district courts in Uttar Pradesh have 82,41,560 criminal cases pending, out of which nearly 30% were filed in the last year itself. Further, According to the prison statistics for 2020, released by the National Crime Records Bureau, Uttar Pradesh has reported the highest number of undertrial prisoners in its jails, totaling 80,577, which constitutes 21.7% of the overall number of undertrials in India. I have only taken the example of Uttar Pradesh, since it is home to BHU, but the situation is similar in many other states. I use these numbers to only highlight how overburdened our courts and jails are. In many instances, these individual cases remain pending before courts because of a lack of effective legal representation for the undertrials. Consequently, 
The undertrials remain languishing in jails while their cases remain on the board for years. It is in these kinds of cases that the assistance and representation offered by legal aid clinics being run under the aegis of clinical legal education can be best utilized. Not only criminal matters, but assistance can also be offered for simple civil cases and disputes, even cases relating to motor vehicles accidents. Simply put, the scope of assistance that can be offered by law students is immense and so is the potential for their professional growth. However, professional growth of law students in only one tenet of clinical legal education, what it achieves is far more important, which is good legal representation to those who cannot otherwise afford it. By doing so, clinical legal education reimagines the role of law schools within communities. They no longer remain isolated islands of excellence, divorced from their surrounding communities, but become active participants in them. Legal aid should also not be limited to providing legal representation, but must encompass within it actions to taken to raise community awareness about legal and constitutional rights. Clinical legal education requires law students to ask themselves, what are the major issues plaguing my immediate community, which may not directly affect me? And more importantly, what can I do about them? When such an attitude is ingrained into young law students in law school itself, one can hope that we will create a new generation of more socially conscious lawyers. In fact, some scholars have also rightly pointed out that not only does clinical legal education ensure legal aid becomes widely available, but that it also promotes a vibrant democracy. When law students participate in clinical legal education, it brings them closer to the communities which surround their law schools, but with whom interaction is often very sparse. In trying to understand and solve their problems, it humanizes these communities in the eyes of the law students who may often come from backgrounds very different from these communities. Hence, the process contributes in the creation of a class of more socially conscious lawyers who can then become active participants in our democracy. Further, by helping these underprivileged communities realize their legal and constitutional rights, clinical legal education ensures that these communities also become more active and informed participants of the democratic framework. Therefore, if we attempt to address the present issue of legal aid and clinical legal education, we will only be setting up the groundwork for our future. Law students of today will become lawyers of tomorrow and will ultimately carry forward the tradition of their legal profession. At the same time, it is important to acknowledge that the legal profession is changing at a very rapid pace, especially due to the onset of new technology. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, courts have started becoming virtual. E-filings are slowly becoming the norm. Hence, the new generation of lawyers will not only have to be prepared themselves, but they will also have to take on the role of educating others, especially those who are less privileged than themselves. There is a digital divide in India, so there is no point in speaking about technology unless we bridge that gap in access to technology. In fact, as part of the Supreme Court's e-committee initiative to develop ICT capabilities, young law students are being trained so that they can soon become trainers themselves. Before I conclude, let me just tell you about one thought which is bothering my mind for quite some time. Law as a social discipline has an integral connect with society. Our institution, the BHU, came into being in the colonial era. In those times, law was not an instrument of protection as the law is intended to be in post-independence India. Our constitution imagines and envisions that law should be an instrument of protection, that the law should be an instrument of transformation, of a social transformation. 
But we also know our history teaches us that law in the colonial times was a weapon of oppression. So the same law has within it the potential to be an instrument of oppression as it has the potential to become an instrument of a social transformation. What outcomes the law will generate depends on those who exercise power within and outside the structures of governance. I'm here not to talk to those who are within the structures of governance because I belong to part of that, namely the judicial institution. But I talk to all of you law students who lie outside today the structures of governance, though many of you I hope will become a part of the structure of governance. But it is your engagement in your daily lives with the law, it is your engagement in your daily lives with the constitution which will determine which way our law will follow for the future. The role of a lawyer is to secure justice to the client. But it becomes problematic when the lawyer becomes a barrier to securing justice to society. Success to the client versus success to the society is a matter of conscience which every lawyer has to decide for herself. When you appear for the accused, you are duty bound to fairly and fearlessly provide legal aid and legal assistance to every accused who comes to you. But this cannot be at the cost of justice to society. So it's important for the lawyer to realize her role in the wider social setup in ensuring that we as lawyers, as judges, continue to be respected by citizens and we will continue to be respected by citizens if we answer their calling that we are here not to provide barriers to justice but that we are here to secure justice to others. It is important for us to spread an awareness of rights. Finally, a word on technology. Technology is not just to service the needs of the well-resourced, of the corporate, of those who are able to pay for justice in terms of technology. The front end of technology must provide ease of access to common citizens. And therefore, it is the reach of the e-committee of the Supreme Court that we must not regard our courts as institutions which represent the sovereign power of the state, but as providers of service. In the British times, they generated these beautiful buildings with extraordinarily imposing architecture. One of the purposes of that architecture was to put fear in the minds of common citizens that this architecture represents the might and the power of the state. That has changed. We have inherited those structures. We have inherited these beautiful buildings. But we have to transform what is inside these structures. We have to transform the ethos of the architecture we have inherited so as not to represent the sovereign power as much the duty of the state to provide service to its citizens. And it is in that duty of service that we must really envision our future. So technology is not merely a means of automation, but of transforming access to justice. Today we have 1.54 billion transactions on ETAL. Our e project provides SMS services to all citizens on their cases. The National Judicial Data Grid is a complete repository of deciding and pending cases. We are able to deliver bail orders to every jail in the country from the Supreme Court. We have a judgment search facility so a young lawyer who cannot afford the cost of a private software can have an automated judgment search facility on the e-committee website. E-filing and digitization envisions that 3,100 crore documents would be digitized in phase 3 of the e courts project. The last word then, don't look upon your role 
merely as lawyers who will enter the court wear a black coat and a you know the lawyer's outfit and get a stay order for your client justice sarosh kapadia who was a former chief justice of india came from very humble backgrounds and he told me how do you identify a judge in the district judiciary and he said his father told him that you identify a judge in the district judiciary in those days in the 1950s and 60s as a person wearing a white pant a black coat a black tie and riding a cycle that is all changed all our judges today have excellent conditions of service and speaking for myself i have no cause to complain <laughs> but i want to tell you as young lawyers follow your dreams if your dreams lie in the pursuit of private gain for yourself or doing well economically so be it let's not be hypocritical about it but i'm sure that many of you will take the call after success as lawyers that there is a higher calling which guides you and that calling is for public service So when I have fancy lawyers appearing before me in the Supreme Court, earning what I believe are fancy fees, I, as a judge and citizen, have no cause to grudge it. I have no cause to grudge it because the beauty of our society lies in accommodating everyone. You must have the best, and you must also have the de most dedicated. So some of you will certainly. join public service you will become legislator you will become councillor you will become you will become ias officer you will join the civil services some of you may not even practice law and become painters poets writers inspire others in whatever you do and leave the world a better place every day of my life i ask myself this question If this today were to be the last day of my life, have I left the world a better place? <laughs> you are too young to ask yourself that question, but you can certainly ask yourself this question: What have I done today to leave the world a better place? and you don't have to do big things to leave a better place for the world you do you leave the better place by being kind to your fellow beings by not being judgmental about the lives of others please realize the true worth of law and the true worth if you all become judges or many of you become judges when you judge you are not judgmental about others you judge with a certain degree of objectivity you stand away from the conflict in courts we are in the midst of conflict but in the midst of conflict we stand away from conflict and it is only when you stand away from the conflict in the court between two warring parties that you realize that you will not be judgmental because it is very easy to be judgmental about the lives of others and difficult to be understanding